Greetings in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ for this podcast on Lent 5, in which we will study John chapter 11, the third in a series of passages from John's Gospel that come from the ancient lectionary that were used during the scrutinies. I have described them in the previous two podcasts, so I won't go into it now. But this John chapter 11, the raising of Lazarus, is a wonderful climax to those scrutinies and an anticipation of what will be coming in the celebration of Easter in a few short weeks. To begin with, I'd like you to consider starting your your sermon with John chapter 5, verses 25 and 28. Because here we see an anticipation of what will take place on the last day, an anticipation of what we see here in the raising of Lazarus, and an anticipation of what we see in the resurrection of Jesus. Let me just read those two passages from you. Verse 25 reads, Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear shall live. Now, that is exactly what happens with Lazarus. And then Jesus says three verses later, Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming in which all who are in the tombs shall hear his voice. So I highly recommend that you begin here by, by in your introduction, using John chapter 5, verses 25 and 28, to anticipate not just this text, but Easter and the, the, the resurrection of all flesh. Now, titles are very important here. Lord is used eight times. Jesus is used by the evangelist in the, in the narrative itself 17 times. The Son of God is used twice. And he is also called rabbi, as he was in the previous passage. He is the I am, the resurrection of, and the life. He is described as the Christ. And he is also described as a teacher. Now, these are, are huge. And, I mean, if you think about, you know, the, 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 the title of Son of God and Christ and another one of the I am's, Rabbi and teacher are the same. And then, of course, the Lord Jesus. These are common titles of Jesus in the narrative. I mean, you, you really have almost every title that you, that you, that you um, might think is of significance. The only one that is not here that was in the previous two is, is the, the fact that he is called a prophet. Now, what, what, what I also want to point out is this, that there is, I think, here, a wonderful sense of what Irenaeus says, that man fully alive, which is what happens to Lazarus in the resurrection, is the glory of God. And that is really, in a sense, the whole point of the New Testament and the new creation. And what we see here in this resurrection is the, the, the goal of his passion, and that the glory of God is in the passion because it shows that he is the master of death and in his resurrection that he is the master of life. And that the glory of God in Christ, in passion, and then in resurrection is the glory of Christians. And I think that there is a strong statement here about the Eucharist, where the Eucharist is the pledge of the resurrection, where the blood that we drink is the blood of the life of the Son of God. Now, of course, the context here is that Jesus is very close to his death. That Jesus, in his obedience and dependence upon the Father, has the authority to give life to whom he wills. And he wills to do it here with Lazarus. Now, let's take an overview of the text here. And it, it is not, it doesn't have as many sections as the one we looked at last week. To begin with, we have the death of Lazarus. So we have the, the recitation of that. And look at the titles that we have here. He's described as Lord, the Son of God, 
uses the word Jesus, and then here's where he is, is a rabbi. Now, look, look at the language here of light. You know, this, the light of the world, the light, you know. Um, and it ends with, with the, 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 the titles of Lord and Jesus then speaking. And interestingly here, we, we have what is going to become a major theme, as I said last week, the, the language of faith, in order that you might believe here in verse 15. In many ways, the central section, at least theologically here, is the, the statement where Jesus speaks of himself as the resurrection of the light. And notice that the title there of, of Lord, and then it is, it is here in verses 25 and 26. And, and I, I would suggest, I mean, it's such a long text and it's such a familiar one. This might be where you want to concentrate your efforts here, you know, where Jesus speaks of himself as the resurrection and the life. And, and he uses here the, the language of faith three times, you know. I mean, there, there's just no way of, of not seeing this as a climactic moment in this text. Um, notice here that also right following the statement of Jesus that he is the resurrection of the life is, is this very, you know, remarkable moment. I mean, it, 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 it's the only word you can use for it where Jesus, the Son of God and the Christ, the one who is coming into the world, and the language of believing. Now, of course, verse 27 is in the, in the, the language of, um, of Martha. And, and Martha is the one who is making this confession, and she gets it. And no, notice how close we are to Jerusalem, that it is a, it is a, a confession that, you know, is a, a wonderful anticipation of what we're going to see happening in Jerusalem. So, a after this section of the resurrection of life, we have that filled with pathos where, where we see Jesus weeping. And, and, of course, he's joining the others who are weeping. And it's here that he is described as the teacher. And again, at the very end, he is called Lord. Okay? And the, the language, you know, uh, of the tomb is there in verse 31. Um, and what I find to re be remarkable at, at the, the very end of this section where we find Jesus weeping is an echo of what we heard in John chapter 9, that refrain we saw over and over again, you know, and, you know, if he's able to open the eyes of the blind, why couldn't he not raise the dead? It, it's amazing. This, this here is the connection to John 9. And you can see the progression here. Eyes are open. And now the dead are raised. Now, obviously, one is, in a sense, greater than the other. But they are part of the reality that Jesus is the creator who has come to his creation to make all things new. It's a, it's a, it's a remarkable moment that, that you should have here in this text. And we're, we're really at the end of the text. Um, or getting to the end, that you would have this affirmation in John 11 of John 9 and what we saw in the opening of the eyes of the blind man. Then the miracle itself. And, uh, you know, th 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 this is such an extraordinary story, and it's told in such an extraordinary way, you know. Um, <clears throat> and, and you can see here, that, that um, the, the way it's set up, you know, he's been in the, the grave four days, he's going to smell. That's here in verse 39, you know. 
Uh, Jesus, you know, brings up the, the language of faith again here. And, and why does he bring up the language of faith? He brings up the language of faith so that they might see the glory of God. Remember I talked about the glory of God before? Now, obviously, it is a sign of the resurrection, but the, the resurrection is only because there is a death. And as you know, the great theme of John's gospel is that the glory of God is in the crucifixion of Jesus. And then you've, you've got the prayer here. And if you're just looking for one place to focus, you might want to just focus on this prayer, along with the statement that he is the resurrection and the life, you know. Um, I don't think it's a coincidence that in, in 41 there, Jesus, as he begins the prayer, raises his eyes, you know. And, you know, Father, I, I, I am giving Eucharist here, you know, because you've heard me. And there's the language of hearing, okay? This goes back to the, to the previous text where we saw that language where the the blind man says, don't you hear me? I mean, and it's hearing the Christ. And the Pharisees didn't hear the Christ. And so their eyes are still blind, you know. And, and you know, verse, verse 42 is, is really so important when, when he says, I knew that thou hearest me always, but because of the people standing around, I said it, that they may believe that you sent me. Now, remember back the works of God of the one who sent him this is this this is the great work of God his his death and resurrection and you know you you, you can't hear the language of thanksgiving here without thinking of the, the, the language of of the Lord's Supper and and I don't in any way want to suggest that this is a connection you know, that this is, in a sense, you know, anticipation of the Eucharist. But what do we give thanks for in the Eucharist? For the body and blood of he who was doing the works of God, which is the, the cross and the resurrection. And we come believing that that is what we receive. Now, of course, the, the, the miracle comes when Jesus cries, Lazarus, come out, you know. And what a remarkable moment that is right there. Uh, there's the great, the great miracle. And, and, and I, I put in blue here because it, it is, uh, again, John is being so explicit here about what th this man looks like in verse 44. You know, he's bound hand and foot with wrappings all over. His face is wrapped with a cloth. And, and the, the simple command to unbind him and let him go. I mean, it, 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 it's such a story to tell. And, and I think in many ways, just telling this story and interpreting it as you do is enough. Um, this isn't part of the text. Um, it, it goes to 53. Um, the, the only verse that is included in the shorter version is, is verse 45. And I, and I, you know, I think that that, is something that you should consider uh, maybe stopping there. I mean, th that, would, that would be, you know, enough, you know, and, you know, th therefore many of the Jews, and, and you can see here in, in 45, um, the, this is the crowd that was with Mary and Martha. Um, they, they were beholding this and they believed. So you, you end with the, the language of belief. But if you want to go on, and, and it's, it's, you know, I mean, it's, you, you have to make some choices here about how much of this text and what part of this text you want to preach on. So, some of you may just choose to preach on this, and I, you know, I wouldn't blame you. Um, the, the, the core to this text, obviously, is um, the language here of uh, Caiaphas. And um, it, it is some of the most cited passages in uh, John's Gospel. Here's Caiaphas, the high priest, you know. 
and um, <clears throat> he is the one who makes that extraordinary statement that it is, it is absolutely important for one man perhaps to perish for the, the people instead of the whole nation to perish. And um, of course, um, in verse 51, uh, he, it, it, this is the evangelist saying he did not do this on, you know, off uh, for himself, you know, but being the high priest that year, he prophesied. And, and here, in, in many ways, is, is the interpretation of, of the whole text here. And, and maybe it anticipates what we're going to be experiencing next week on Palm Sunday. Uh, 52, uh, 51b um, and 52. And this is John. John's interpreting for us that Jesus was going to die. And here's the atonement on behalf of the nation. Nations, really. And, and then it says, and this, this qualification, you know, that is, and not for the nation only, but so that he might gather together the children of God, the ones who were scattered, gather them together. Soon I, that's where the word synagogue comes from, into one. And that is, unity is the great theme of John's gospel. Now, let me close by suggesting this. I, I, I was going to go through, go back and go through the whole text again, but I, my, my time is, is coming to an end here. L let me just suggest this. Um, if you have been pre preaching on these three texts as the scrutinies, and, and we're, we're talking now about how they were directed in their original early Christian context to unbaptized, to uncover any kind of shame that would keep them from, you know, wanting to enter into the presence of God in baptism and the Lord's Supper because of their unworthiness, because of their uncleanness, because of their pollution. One of the things that you could conclude here is, is that is that what baptism and the Lord's Supper do, which is the climax of the Paschal mystery, this is what Easter is all about, is that it makes us one in Christ. And that that's what they're going to be baptized into. They're going to be baptized into the one who makes us one. And I, and I think that's a, a, a very important theme today, where we have such divisions uh, in our country, in our churches, in our families, that it seems as if everything is coming apart, that things are, are just being kind of blown apart by the culture in which we live, and that it's, it's very important to affirm that the unity that we have comes in Christ, in baptism, at the table, and that in many ways, as we celebrate the death and resurrection of Jesus on Easter, Good Friday and Easter, what we're celebrating is the fact that we are one in Christ. And that in this, this divisive world in which we live, the one thing we can really affirm on Easter Sunday is, the, is that because Jesus is living water, because when we worship him, in spirit and truth, we are worshiping him, the one who makes us one. That because Jesus is the bread of life and the light of the world and opens our eyes to see the reality of the world through him. And that he is the resurrection and the life and that in him we have that unity that we celebrate in his death and resurrection. That this is the purpose of his mission. And that even though he stated it in a negative term to condemn the world, that judgment of the Father upon him on Good Friday and his vindication on Easter Sunday is why we are together as the church, one in Christ, now and for the ages of ages. Amen.